sing it, church. Living water on my fountains are in you. Strong like a river. You're strong like a river. Your love is running through all. just ask that your Holy Spirit would rain down on us today. That, Father, as we come into your holy presence, that your spirit would fall this morning. Like rain upon each one in this room today. That, God, we would be refreshed and renewed. And that, Father God, your holy presence would be with us. Help us to get into the river of life today, we pray. In Jesus' holy name. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Take us to the throne. Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout. 
take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall
So we're going to sing a new song today. And um, just encourage you, if you can't uh, figure out the lyrics, I know a hard song, new songs are hard sometimes. Just let us sing it over you. Let, it, let us pray it over you. Matthew talks about how Jesus leaves the 99 to find the one. And sometimes that's reckless. So we're going to sing about the reckless love of God. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night, and I couldn't.
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, just now to me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming out to me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming out to me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming out to me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming out to me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming out to me.
all the earth. Your breath. 
So we learned a new song this morning, or some of us learned a new song this morning. Some of you probably already knew it. But in that, we started with the, that verse where Jesus is explaining the kingdom of God to his disciples. And he recorded for us in Matthew where he says that your heavenly father is like a shepherd. He's got a flock of sheep and there's a hundred in the flock. And he counts at the end of the day and there's ninety nine. And he says, I'm really grateful for the 99 that are there, but right now I've got to go find the one that's missing. I've got to go find the one that's missing. And it says something about his heart for you. Some of you I know are, are here, and, and you're kind of here on check it out mode. Because maybe somewhere along the line, something pretty significant or drastic happened in your life, and you're kind of going, man, I need some answers. I need some support. I need some help. Maybe it's just you've kind of gone through a phase in life and you're just kind of saying, ah, it's got to be something different. It, it, it can't keep going the way it's going. And somebody said, why don't you, why don't you try Jesus? Or, you know, maybe you're, you went to church years ago and you're kind of saying, well, maybe I'll try that again and I'll go back and take a look at that. So I realize you're kind of looking. I want you to know that if you're looking, it's because Jesus has already been calling to you. He was there first. Before you thought he might be an answer, he was already calling out to you saying, I am the answer. He was already looking for you. And so Jesus is really excited about everybody that's here that always comes, has already decided they're going to heaven, already decided that Jesus is going to be the Lord of their life, and he helps each and every one of us. And we can tell you stories, and you're going to hear one today about how faithful God is and how he takes care of us and how he helps us. So Jesus is really excited about the 99, but he has a priority over the one. He has a priority over the one. So if you're looking, Jesus was already looking for you. If you're wondering, Jesus was already calling to you. He cares and he's concerned. So we're going to sing. It's a new song. We're going to sing it again. But I want you to know that this is Jesus' heart for you. That he cares about you. And he's not upset that you got lost along the way. He's not mad about that. He cares about that. And before you knew you were lost, he was looking for you. Because he already missed you. That's his heart for you today. Okay? So we're going to sing it again. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night and night. I couldn't earn. 
deserve it still you give yourself away and all the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God When I was your foe, when I was your foe, still you love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no So the question isn't whether God wants you or whether he's going to accept you. He decided that a long time ago. The question this morning is, are you ready to be found? Are you ready to be found? Because Jesus has been looking. We've been hiding. He's been calling. We've been ignoring. He's been loving and we've been resisting. Are you ready to be found? And so, Father, for every person this morning who is ready to be found, 
I pray, Father, that you would hear the prayer of their heart. You would hear them surrender. You would hear them say, okay, enough of me, more of you. Enough of my way, more your way. And God, even if it's just a simple, I give up. Because <laughs> I'm overwhelmed, I'm frustrated, I don't know what to do. Everything I've tried has made it worse or just kind of been neutral. I haven't been able to make this thing move in the direction it needs to go. I just quit. I'm tired. That's okay. Because when lost sheep just lie down and say, I don't know what to do, you come find them, pick them up, and carry them back. And say, welcome home. Welcome back to the family, to the flock, to the place where there's food and there's water and there's safety and protection. Welcome back. So God, thank you. Thank you for looking for us even when we weren't yet ready to be found. But thank you this morning for those who have let you find them in this moment. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Hey, thanks for being here and hanging out with us today. Grab a seat. Mr. Bernheisel, I think you've got some sort of uh, JBQ announcement, and we're going to go from there. Good morning. Welcome uh, to Parkway. We appreciate you the, that are able to come this morning. Um, my wife and I do junior Bible quiz. I just wanted to just really quickly let you guys know these kids work really hard um, learning the Word of God. They study about an hour a week. And in the mornings when you guys are all probably getting ready for your day, they are here at 830 every Sunday morning. And we have practice and their parents get up early and bring them as well. So it's a big sacrifice and commitment. I would say that um, most adults probably don't even study their Bible an hour a week, but um, not to make you feel guilty, but maybe conviction. So, um, so anyways, they, they work really hard, and we had a tournament last week. So for those of you that come regularly, you know what that is. They, they have, um, we have three on the A team and two on the C team. And what they do is they compete against other teams, up to four quizzers. They ask, we asked 20 questions a round, and they did three rounds this last time. So... Uh, they sit at the buzzer, and whoever buzzes in fast enough gets the answer. If they get six right, it's called a quiz out, and they have to sit out that round and wait till the next round because we don't want one person getting all 20 questions. So, um, so that's a good thing when they get a quiz out. So this last, last weekend, we had Gabe's on the A team and Bella and Keaton, and the A team took first place this last weekend. So... That has become the A-team norm, so uh, no pressure on them at all. But Bella took first place this last weekend. She had, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> she had three quiz outs during the tournament, and Keaton took second place, and he had one quiz out during the tournament. So they did a good job. <laughs> Our seat division, they took second place at the tournament. That's Elizabeth and Winston down on the end there. Yeah, they did a great job. Elizabeth took second place with two quiz outs, and Winston took fourth place with one quiz out. So they did a good job. So we're proud of our, our quizzers and JBQ. They put in a lot of effort, and we just really appreciate your guys' prayers and support for that. Um, and we appreciate the families that do it as well and the commitment. So if you guys would like to do JBQ, I know some people have come to us mid-season and said, can we start? It's really hard to start mid-season. You'll be... Um, really discouraged because you're so far behind. So in August, we'll start a new team up and you can come join us then. I'm going to have the kids come forward right now. We have uh, first through fifth grade are coming come up uh, with Pastor St. John and his team. And then the middle scorers are meeting Pastor Stephen in the back. They are going to be talking about UH Three Amigos, which I really want to tell you what I think that is, but um, I don't. I think you'll have to ask the middle scorers or Pastor Stephen. So... Um, I'm going with Under Heaven, Three Amigos. So that's what I'm going with, um, the UH. What's that? I'm not going to hear 
Unlikely heroes. Oh, I was going with under heaven. I, I liked the, the Trinity. That's what I thought. But, all right. And the kids, they're going to do Jesus as our example this morning. So, they're coming. All right, let's go ahead and as they come down, let's pray for our kids and our middle scores as they go and learn the Word of God. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this generation, God. We thank you, Lord, that you have trusted us with them, God. God, may we have a heart for kids, Lord. May we protect them, not only emotionally, but physically, Lord Jesus, and spiritually, God. We pray that you go with them today, Lord. Be with the leaders, Lord, that they would embark your spirit in them, Lord, and shine a light in a dark place. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. We're going to multitask because we can do that, I think. Um, February 4th is membership class. Following the service is going to be in the fellowship hall. So if you don't know where the fellowship hall is, you leave the building here. You can go to the right. You don't have to completely leave the building, the hallway here. And the fellowship hall is down there. So if you want to be a member, that is going to be starting February 4th. You can still attend the annual business meeting, um, which is going to be on February 20th. will be the pre-business meeting where we're going to go over all the financials for those of you that want to talk about that. And then the last weekend in February will be the actual business meeting where we actually do the vote and pass about the budget and all that. So if you have questions and want to know anything about the finances, come to the pre-business meeting so that we don't spend all of our time in the business meeting talking about details that other people just want to get bored with. So um, if you're a nerd like me and like accounting, then come on February 20th. Okay? If you also want to know where your tithe money goes, you can come on February 20th. Life After 50 has a Valentine banquet on February the 16th at the GP Golf Course. You can sign up in the foyer, um, and if you have any more questions about that, you can see them out front. So, Pastor Ron is going to come up. He has a, an important announcement. Oh, one thing I, I wasn't on here that I'm going to mention anyways. We're leaving the youth group. We're leaving Thursday to go to GU. So, talking about lighting up places and kicking down walls and tearing down lies. Be praying for the youth group. We're leaving Thursday. We're going to be gone till Saturday. It's Generation Unleashed. It's a great, turn, great conference. We're looking forward to it. We're looking for people to get snot rocked at that conference. So that's what it's all about. Pastor Ron. Thank you. Boy, you got lots of stuff in there in a short period of time. Uh, if you turn off the video stream, we'd appreciate that. Uh by the Lord. And when we break, it is in his gentle hands that we are picked up, healed and molded back together with seams of gold. We are made even more beautiful for our scars, yet whole and able to serve in his kingdom. Join us at Parkway Christian Center in 2018 for our eight-week testimony series. Come and witness grace. You're not nervous or anything, are you? Uh, no, I've only been sweating since I woke up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've already changed my shirt like five times. <laughs> it's all good. <clears throat> Here, Jason, we Here, got one for you, you, buddy. You get the mic. I don't get a cool head. It's not even on. Okay. No, it's, yeah, they'll turn it <laughs> <on. laughs> I'm, br I'm bringing Brittany back. <clears throat> it's a 90 singer. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> So this is Bonnie, and this is Jason. They go together. Yes, we do. <laughs> and they've got kids. They've, so this is a family. I, I'm not sure exactly when the first time was that I, that I met you guys. I know I met you at our home because you were doing some work there. Um, and I heard part of your story because Jeanette said that you had some really interesting ink and that there was a story connected to that and she asked you about that story and so I got to, f to hear a little bit of that secondhand and then uh, met you, I know, at a Royal Family Kids uh, Banquet where you were our guest speaker and you, you told a little bit of that story so I know that some people know a little bit about that. Uh, then sometime after that, then I, I met Jason and uh, you were kind of on your own journey. We met and had a couple of conversations and. Uh, um, one of the things that I've noticed is you've got your, you've got your son's name on, on one arm over there, and uh, I, I think your daughter's responsible for designing the ink on the other side. And that's she'll the, be happy when I finish it, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she'll be happy when you do that. So uh, you guys kind of carry your story quite literally with you. 
um, you know, you, you have kind of a remembrance here that says some things about uh, life and about your perspective on that now. And, you know, Jason, we talked a little bit about the fact, you know, that every time you reach out and get something, you reach out with your, with your family and with your kids. There's a real symbolism to that, and uh, there's a story connected to that. And uh, that's the story we want to hear. So uh, let's, let's hear what your guys' story is. Okay. Are you ready? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I can't run now. <laughs> so, hi, church family. Uh, my name is Bonnie Van Dusen. And I'm Jason Van Dusen. And today we are sitting in front of you as a wife and a husband that are so loved by a man, a great man, with a marriage that is solid, not perfect, but solid, a son, daughter, and a daughter that are finally seen their eternal worth in his eyes. A mother and a father of three, and on other days, a mother and a father of two, five, or seven. See, over the last two years, Jason and I have been doing foster care, so our family, you can say, fluctuates daily, weekly, or monthly. Our broken love story was redeemed by a greater love story, his our brokenness is no longer a source of shame, but a platform upon which the power of God can be mostly clearly put on display. It is not a road to avoid, but the pathway through which God has chosen to bring great beauty out of tragic brokenness. <clears throat> See, darkness is a piece of our story, and we must simply own it, speak it, and bring meaning to it through reaching out to others in the midst of their mess and brokenness. See, we are most alive when we expose our deepest vulnerabilities and insecurities, like being up here. <laughs> our ink, the words that I carry as a daily reminder of where I have been and where I'm going, are marked on me forever. The quotes are my battle scars that I openly wear so I, so you, can see how God has shown up and redeemed my brokenness. And for me, the graphic representation of a son and a daughter, one blood, but both in my heart, mm -hmm. display a message of love and dedication mm -hmm. to my family, holding on or loving with all my heart and a constant reminder of what God enabled. These words are my way to say Jesus has been and always will be there for you and for me. I survive because you failed in making moments matter. These quotes might not make a whole lot of sense to you now, but see, church, they will soon. For those of you that have heard bits and pieces of our testimonies before, sorry, some of this may sound familiar, as we bring you back to the beginning to share with you where it started, our chapters in life 1 through 22. But today you also get to hear a few new chapters, the chapters of the aftermath and the redemption that he, that you, are all a part of, chapters 23 through 36. This is our story. Can I share this? I guess. That's marriage right there. <laughs> <laughs> My part. I was born in Livermore, California in uh, 1981, small town at the time. I was raised in a nice house on a suburb street and friends are just around every corner. A bit of a spoiled happiness, I must say. My brother, three years older than I, we had a pretty good relationship, brothers doing what brothers did. My parents definitely took care of us. I was an athlete, and a good one at that, I must say. Baseball was my life. <laughs> I was a pretty normal kid. I definitely pushed the limits of my parents, and uh, simply to see how far I could take it, like any child does. They would definitely let me know when I would cross that line or go too far, and spankings were relatively normal. And the occasional belt whooping from my dad was ready and waiting for when I was really bad. I wouldn't call it abuse. It was just normal discipline for that time. All in all, we were a tight-knit, happy family. And no, God was not even a topic of conversation, uh, let alone a priority in my family. In fact, we didn't have much of any conversations about God that I can remember. There were a lot of great times, and there were a lot of dark times as well. I vaguely remember one time, I want to say I was about seven or eight years old, when my uncle uh, committed suicide and shot himself in the head. 
I remember crying so hard and not knowing what was happening, but I felt a lot of pain and sadness, and I obviously wasn't told the full story until much later or much older, but at that time, I was watching my mom and my other family members break down and be in so much pain and heartbreak that it was kind of chaos for me. I began fourth grade, a pretty normal, happy life when things started happening that would kind of change my life forever. I remember days at home where I could hear arguments, my, brothers, my brother and I playing in our bedrooms, pretending we couldn't hear, um, but my parents screaming and yelling, trying their best to keep quiet while fighting. After one night, I can remember walking into their bedroom and seeing that my dad had put a hole through their bathroom door. I remember days they would argue, and quickly after, my dad screeching out of the garage and burning rubber down the street, and with all that happening, they just went on pretending like everything was perfect, or at least okay. That is until they couldn't pretend anymore. My mom and dad decided that a divorce was the best option. <clears throat> my brother and I were in shock, at loss for words, and there was really nothing we could do. Um, I would stay up late some nights and talk and cry with my mom about how I didn't want my dad not to be there anymore. And I wanted my parents together. As much as my mom would say that it wasn't my fault, clearly felt like maybe if I was better or if I didn't do some of the things that I did, maybe my parents would still love each other and still stay together. A lot of time went by and I can remember trying to get used to only seeing my dad sporadically throughout the week. He would stop by and here and there and try and stay in contact, but he was fighting his own internal turmoil. My mom was doing the best she could to raise us boys on her own, and by the way, my mom's up there. I love you so much. Um, I think one of the hardest things was watching him sell my childhood home. Um, that hit me hard, not only not being able to stay in that home, but explaining to friends that I had why they couldn't come over and play and hang out at that home anymore. I guess it was kind of embarrassment. Not too long after all this went down, um, my mom decided to move my brother and up to a little old town called Grants Pass, Oregon. <laughs> I attended Fort Vinoy Elementary School for my fourth grade year, but in fifth grade, she decided to move us back. It's all right. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, leaving all my friends behind and starting a new life was one thing, but we came back to California, and my mom had begun dating a man. Um, he was, I could definitely see the happiness in her eyes from time to time. She had begun going to church with him and eventually started bringing my brother and I with her. Uh, I was very apprehensive. I just didn't want to go. Um, my mom definitely had her way, and I was forced to attend Sunday service, dressed in my shirt and tie. <laughs> no more shirt and tie. <laughs> well, shirt, but... Um, I did what I had to do. We would have missionaries uh, from the Mormon church come and visit us at home, and I remember hiding at my friend Luke's house around the block, because I just didn't want to have any part of it. I also remember my brother walking up to a little fort that we had made, and uh, while I'm hiding in there, knocking on the door, trying to see if I was there, but me re remaining super silent so he wouldn't know. Um, I eventually surrendered and voluntarily was baptized, uh, primarily because the missionaries would stop coming by after that. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, I believe that something was up there, but I wasn't entirely ready to put a label on it, I guess you could say. Middle school unfolded a glimpse into some not-so-wonderful pathways I would eventually take head on. I remember trying marijuana for the first time in seventh grade. Some friends I had at the time were traveling fast down this road, and I began hanging with some crowds of friends that my mom would not have approved of or did approve of but didn't fully know what these friends were all about. I began, uh, excuse me, once high school kind of came into play, and I'm kind of bouncing around, I apologize, but I began smoking cigarettes and marijuana con and continued that. Um, these were pretty regular things, and they honestly nearly took over my high school life. Um, I remember by the end of my sophomore year, my mother had decided to move back to Oregon. My brother was off at a college in Arizona, and I was left with a choice to 
go with my mom or stay here with my dad and finish up high school, and I chose the latter. With my mom an eight-hour drive away and my dad focusing on his life and his priorities, I felt like I was on my own. I continued my cigarette and marijuana addictions. I continued going to school. I maintained decent grades. I played sports, and I worked part-time at nights after school. That was my life mainly to support my habits as well as pay rent and pay my dad back for every little thing that I might have borrowed money for. I started selling marijuana to make more money and obviously spent that on what I thought was important. Girls, drugs, good times. I graduated high school. I started working full time and began attending college, uh, tech school. All the while, I was still smoking both of these things, and day and night, and I was partying constantly. I did graduate college, and I proved to myself, so I thought, that I could uh, hold my own through anything. Well, right out of college, I began working at an electronics distributor. I was working in the shipping and receiving department. Couldn't really find a job in the field that I had gotten my degree in, and I made friends quickly and spent a majority of my time working and pretty much getting high whenever I could. I had been hanging with friends that got into some pretty major drugs, and rather than choosing to steer clear, I kind of joined right in, and all of a sudden I found myself in a full-fledged cocaine habit. I was 20 years old. <clears throat> I'm shaking. <laughs> I was quickly introduced to meth through my job and friends that I had there. At this point, I was pretty much just spinning out of control. My marijuana, cocaine, meth, all my addictions were pretty much just controlling my life. <clears throat> Working was a means of supporting my addictions, and throughout all this behavior, I managed not only to keep a job, but support myself or support whatever relationship I was in at the time. I didn't credit anything to God. Staying out of jail, no diseases, relatively healthy, I mean, aside from losing about 50 pounds. This lifestyle continued for about two, maybe three years. Um, it's a little vague. <laughs> Until one day, I kind of just said enough. I mean, partly due to the fact that my job had been changing and the people that I knew and relied on for that fix, they were being let go and they were leaving that job. So the connection went away. I focused on my job and now that I've been, uh, so basically I stopped and that was it. And from then on, I focused on my job and I'd been working my ways up. Eventually, after years, I became a marketing director for this same company and kind of left all that behind. I was still smoking cigarettes and I was still occasionally smoking marijuana, but what I considered, I said, the hard drugs were done. I was, I was moving on to the next phase of my life. And I was feeling better, stronger, and life was definitely taking some pretty incredible turns. <laughs> But the darkness did have a way of following me and masking itself within that happiness. So that is my story. <laughs> my turn. <laughs> um, I was born in Los Gatos, California. You could say brokenness runs in my family. My parents both came from broken homes. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Divorce, mental sickness, abuse. So you could say I carried on the family tradition. My parents were young when I was born, and sadly, because of both of their brokenness, I was born into a family that had ended before it began. <clears throat> my parents had been divorced since I could remember. Most of my memories of them together revolved around them in anger, hurt, and anxiety. They never had a nice word to say about each other. <clears throat> I honestly do not remember much of my childhood. I do know it was made up, not made up of I love yous and hugs before bedtime. In fact, it wasn't until recently I said I love you to my mom for the first time and really understood what that meant. I do get flashbacks, like watching cartoons with my mom while my dad was running late for yet another weekend visit. 
I remember my dad and me sitting in his driveway of his house one day crying and begging me to come live with him. See, my parents both broken from their past and now broken and hurt by each other. I was just a piece of the game on who could win their daughter's heart, not because they actually wanted to win my heart, because winning meant they weren't losing to each other. I would eventually pick up my game piece and play in this game of life. I moved in with my father, who remarried to my stepmom. They had three kids together and lived in San Jose, California. Sorry. This was my chance to be a part of a family, to love and be loved, but it wasn't. I was always looking in from the outside. My dad was always harder on me than my siblings, and well, my, I wasn't my stepmom, so I thought I had to try harder with her. At first, I thought it was because I was the oldest, but as time went on, I would realize it wasn't. I remember one time, my dad found a pack of bubblegum cigarettes in my room. He was so upset. I mean, it made no sense to me as he was a smoker himself, so why did this anger him so? But it set him off so much that he wanted me to know, as a seven-year-old, that smoking was not in my near future. So he opened up a pack, and one by one, cigarette after cigarette, I was forced to smoke them until the whole pack was nothing but ashes and butts. I think I have never been so sick in my life. I remember every Thursday was chore night, which meant I got to clean the bathrooms. <laughs> I remember spending hours in one bathroom because I would clean it to a seven-year-old standard of cleanliness. But time after time, my stepmom would come in and say, it's just not good enough. You're not good enough. How can you not handle this simple task? Years of this, <clears throat> years of this with her would build and repeat in my head, comments under her breath. If you did not live here, my family would be so much better. Yet again, here we are having to hold off on something for my kids because of you. During this time that I lived with my dad, my mom would eventually move and marry my stepdad. I was broken. I was hurt. In my eyes, she abandoned me. She ran off, remarried, and had another child. How could she abandon me? How could she have another child when she did not even want me? I wish I could say the man she married welcomed me with open arms. I guess he tried his best, but he too was broken. And I was yet again a part of another broken family with a marriage that consisted of vulgar references of what was expected of a wife, drinking, depression, and so much more. Here I, I was again, not fully a part of his family, not fully a part of her family, looking at both from the outside. The reality was, yes, I was mad at her, but I was madder at the fact she could not see what was really happening in my life. <clears throat> the phone calls about school, lying, stealing, acting out, she could not see my cry for help. She abandoned me with him. My father had a few secrets, and so did I. My father had been physically and mentally, emotionally abusing me for years. <clears throat> I'd been thrown up against walls, through sliding doors, into bookshelves, doors slammed on my body. I've had guitars broken on my back. I've had welts and bruises that have lasted for days, weeks, months. I've been spit on, while every word has been used to tell me how unworthy, disgusting, and unloved I was. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> my father would make it a game during certain beatings that if I cried while he was beating me, the beatings would become more intense. So I learned to be quiet. I learned not to cry because crying meant weakness and weakness meant pain. Something I had to unlearn, as you can see. It would take me over 20 years to be able to cry and 10 years into my marriage before my husband would ever see me shed a tear. <clears throat> when I get asked about my dad, the common question is why? Why would you stay? Honestly, I think I just wanted to be loved. Whether good or bad, I was acknowledged. I was being seen. There was that connection to a family I never had and never would have. 
Most of the time when he was hurting me, he acknowledged I was connected to him. I was connected to her. That's why I'm hurting you. In those moments, I was not broken, but connected to them. The other truth is my siblings. I stayed for them because as they got older, they became his next target. I had opportunities to flee from my dad's house, and I did when I was in the middle of my sixth grade year. I moved in with my mom, but she had just had my little brother and was dealing with her hurt, her depression, her life, and I was just there in the middle of it all. I tried to move on with my life and started over, but weekend visits brought me right back. The control, the head games, and the pain, knowing that I left my siblings alone with him. My move with my mom was short-lived, and I moved back in with my dad. At the same time, he would move, and my mom would move to Livermore, California. You would have thought that when I moved back with my dad, that would have been an eye-opener for him to change But the truth was, it was an eye-opener for him to make sure I was so broken. I was living in so much shame that I would never leave. That no one would believe what was really going on behind closed doors. This was his time to take back control. Soon after moving back in with my dad, my stepmom had taken a job where she traveled a lot. Along Along with that, my dad was a truck driver. So he was under a lot of stress and pressure. That stress and pressure would soon mean we picked up where we last left off. But this time there was more. My father would not only physically and mentally abuse me, but it would soon lose to sexual abuse. The one thing I was yearning for, the one thing I so desperately wanted was to be loved and to be a part of something, but I couldn't. I was so alone and so broken. I got pretty good at pretending and living a life of lies. I definitely was not perfect. I wasn't, I wasn't a good teenager and I was acting out. I grew up in the Bay Areas in the 90s where I was the minority. Blank the Police was my favorite song and my, uh, of mine and standing outside the local 7-Eleven to get my fix of boons in Old English was a part of my youth. I know you can't imagine it now, but locker room fights is where I did most of my counseling sessions. I was an easy target with a lot going on behind the scenes, and a few girls learned the hard way that this tiny white girl was more than they bargained for. (laughs) A few years would go by, the lies, the abuse, the fights, it seemed no one would ever notice, no one would ever see me, and the hell I lived in every day. But during my sophomore year, I would start to date, and that brought on a whole new level of abuse and control. My father liked to power play with my boyfriends, and luckily enough, I found a guy that was just as crazy as him. That boyfriend boyfriend would be one of the largest producers and sellers in our area. So you could say he did not scare off easily, and he would help me to start finding my voice. Our relationship was built off drugs, lies, and brokenness but he would be my first, at least the first I choose to remember. He would be the start of what I would build all other relationships off of. While our relationship was all things wrong, he would be what was right for me. He knew bits and pieces of my broken story and he begged to do something about it, but I told him no. I was fine. The truth was I wasn't. I was barely holding on. And then it happened, the last straw. The fight that I knew would change my life forever. Eventually, you're pinned up against the wall. And in this case, I was pinned up against the wall with hands wrapped around my neck, grasping for air and feet dangling. I had mouthed off to him, and he had to set me straight. After that day, I knew things had to change. No one could see the scars I carry. No one could see my hurt. I needed someone to see me. I had decided that after I went to work that next day, I was going to kill myself. I knew that while no one saw me now, there would be no way to deny something was horribly wrong once they found my body. If this is what I had to do to stop him, to protect them, and to stop the hurt, then this is what needed to happen. 
I left to go to work that day. I worked as a courtesy clerk at our local PW supermarket. I had worked there for about six months or so, day in and day out. The same people, the same schedule, but that day was different. That day we had a new manager covering. I had never seen her, I had never talked to her before, but in a moment she changed my life, making moments matter. In a moment she acknowledged me, she said hi, then she asked me how I was doing and what was going on. A total stranger, someone that had never seen me before could recognize I was carrying something so heavy, something people I had known for years could never see. She saw it in that moment. 16 years of floodgates came down, and in that moment, she saved my life. She gave me two choices. She'd be calling the cops, or I could call my mom, but either way, I would not be going back to my dad's house. So I picked up the phone, and I called my mom. Over the next few months, I would adjust, well, adjust as, as well as I could to the aftermath. Nothing happened to my dad. That whole side of the family would abandon me. I lost family, friends, and I would not be allowed to have contact with my siblings. I had to file and take my dad to court to ask a judge to give me my things. See, it was bad enough I lost the people I love, but my dad, he needed more. <clears throat> and the things I called mine, he said I could not have. So I had to face him after accusing him. After losing it all, I had to stand in front of a judge and beg for my things back. The judge was kind enough to acknowledge my request, and a day later I received a few black garbage bags full of my things shredded, broken, and tossed on the curb. You want to know what hurt the most that day? It wasn't facing him. It wasn't having to beg for my things. But it was after court when I saw them in the lobby. When I saw my dad and my stepmom, and all she could ask was, how could I lie? How could I put her family through the humiliation? How could I affect her? You want to know another secret? I admitted to my mom in the courts about the physical and emotional abuse, but the sexual abuse I would carry that secret for 15 more years. And that secret would eat away at me in ways I never thought possible. I went on with my senior year and attended Granada High School in Livermore. This is where you could say I discovered my voice. Being real, being truthful, this is where I no longer would be afraid to say how I felt or what was going on in my mind. I broke up with my crazy boyfriend and my life hit the fast lane. Boys, parties, drugs, that was the new life I lived and it was fun. Exciting, but eventually it caught up with me And after graduating high school. I had fallen in love in the midst of the madness, a boy that filled every single daddy issue I had. I was happy, I thought I was in love, and I was pregnant. I was 19, fulfilling all of my dad's words. I would never amount to anything. I would fail in every way possible. <clears throat> So just to be safe, I went to the doctor where she did blood work. The blood work came back negative. The doctor figured the stress of my dad, my family was causing, was causing me not to be normal and to come back in a few months. I know what you're thinking, your dad, but it's been a few years, so why would that affect your health? Well, three years of my life went on and I had no contact with my family. I had no clue what was going on with my siblings. Then one day, while I was at work, my mom showed up in the middle of my shift. It's your dad. He's in jail. He tried to kill your stepmom. I was in shock. While I thought all was moving on in my dad's life, the reality was it was falling apart. My dad and my stepmom's marriage got really bad. His attention and control turned to her, and divorce was her answer. He would be charged and serve 11 years for attempted premeditated murder. During that time, I would find out that my dad had suffered from bipolar disorder and was self-medicating with large doses of drug use. Yes, I was stressed. And three months later, as I continued to party, I started becoming very sick. Uh-oh. <laughs> I went to the doctors, and there he was, my little boy. I was three months pregnant. I was too far along to do something about it except face the truth and face my mom. 
So I did. I faced my mom a few days later. I was stupid. I was not thinking. I was running, ruining my life. I would fail. In those moments, in her words, all his words came racing back into my mind. She eventually calmed down after a few days and gave me an ultimatum. She would allow me to live in her house while I was pregnant only if I and Isaiah's dad would go, to her, go with her to a local adoption agency. She wanted us to look at our options. Isaiah's father wanted nothing to do with me being pregnant. He informed me if I wanted to keep the baby, I would be on my own. So talking him into going to this meeting was not that hard because in the end, it meant he was off the hook. Weeks following that appointment, her words, his words repeat, repeated through my mind. Why would I fail? Why was I stupid? Because I never wanted kids. I never wanted to repeat their mistakes. And here I was bringing a baby into something I already knew a broken family. I worked two jobs. I got my own place. I was going to school and doing something. I was finally moving on. I even started talking to my mom again. The day Isaiah was born was literally the scariest, yes, most exciting day of my life. I was two weeks overdue as this little guy did not want to come into the world, and I did not blame him. <laughs> a day later and a C-section scar to prove it, Isaiah Christopher was born. All 11 and a half pounds of him. <laughs> People, I had a turkey growing in me. <laughs> Oh, that was the day I started to know what love was. It was the day my mom would get to hold my son, and since then, Isaiah has put a sparkle in her eye. I would struggle with being a single mom. I was not a bad one, but I also wasn't a great one. I still struggled with insecurities, reaching out to Isaiah's dad or other men. I struggled with trying to find balance between being a mom and a child still myself. Isaiah's dad would pop in and out of the picture throughout my pregnancy and afterwards, in between his girlfriend's drugs. It was a failed relationship at one I tried for so long to fix for the sake of our child. But then I met Jason. <laughs> yeah, applause is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> so next part is us together. <clears throat> Bonnie and I met one day in the hospital emergency room. I was there waiting my visit with the doctor for kidney stones. <laughs> and then along comes this beautiful woman and her friend Chandra. I have to say that name because I'm going to reference that. I had known Chandra. Um, they were bringing Chandra's son Jordan in uh, to see a doctor. He had an accident. We introduced ourselves and then we pretty much went on with our normal lives. I remember a few days later, I received a call from my friend Mike, who was Chandra's boyfriend at the time, um, about possibly hanging out with this girl named Bonnie and all of their friends. Well, it turns out they were heading to a strip club. So my answer was, I mean, my answer was, yeah, that sounds like, <laughs> that, that sounds like a, a little bit of fun, sure. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> So, Bonnie and I shared our first kiss on the corner of Broadway and Montgomery Avenue outside of a strip club in San Francisco, California. <clears throat> Things definitely moved very quickly. We were sexually active right away. We'd smoke cigarettes and marijuana together and pretty much hang out every single day. In fact, it wasn't until a couple days later that I found out she had a son. Isaiah was about a year and a half when I came into her life, and he was the cutest little thing I had ever seen. I remember days of playing and hanging out with him, and I would help Bonnie take care of him and pretty much do whatever needed to be done. 
I never thought I could actually fall in love with a boy before I fell in love with his mom, but it happened. <laughs> I had a spot in my heart picked out and ready for this boy, and yes, I was quite fond of his mother too. <laughs> I eventually moved in with Bonnie and Isaiah and their little apartment, ironically, the same apartment that uh, only a few doors down from where my mom had moved my brother and I when we lost our home. God works in mysterious ways. Um, but I was also still paying rent at a place and helping out where uh, I was staying with my dad. We had moved rather quickly in our relationship. We met in October of 2003, and we were engaged in late May of 2004. We also had a bit of a surprise be prior being to engaged. I was pregnant yet again with another child. We were married July 4th, 2004. See, we'll always have fireworks in our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> our little girl, Nevaeh, was born December of 2004, and Jason officially adopted Isaiah in 2005. We are blessed. <clears throat> but the honeymoon phase of our marriage quickly faded. See, in all the relationships I had been in, I had been cheated on by a majority of the girls that I was with, and so insecurity pretty much ran rampant in me. I would accuse Bonnie of extramarital affairs and constantly showed extreme jealousy, and I always wanted to know where she was, and I was trying my best to, to trust her, but honestly, I failed every time. We would have a ton of arguments, and we'd scream and yell at each other pretty much daily. We struggled with handling these situations, me running away from it and brushing it off due to my family history, and Jason always wanting to talk it out. <laughs> <clears throat> this led to some violent outbursts on my part, needing to do whatever I had to avoid a conversation. This would at times include hitting, pushing, and the use of an occasional object. I went through a few curling irons. We struggled, both of us came from broken homes and were raising two kids within the first two years of our marriage. We never really had our time together. We attended marriage counseling to help, but even after that, we would find ways to deflate one another. <clears throat> okay, I'm lost. <laughs> when, I, when Bonnie and I were actually able to talk, one of the things we always spoke about was how neither one of us believed in divorce. No matter how many times we uttered the words in the midst of a rage and uh, anger-filled fight, we pretty much knew that divorce was not an option. For our kids' sake, for the sake of our family, and despite the darkness and the issues at hand, we would stick it out. A few years went by, and changes were definitely happening in our family. Jason has quit his job of 10 years and started his business. I was laid off from my job and also began a little business of my own. But we had a decision to make, and moving seemed to be the best answer. We moved our family up to Grants Pass, Oregon, as California life was just too expensive, and our only other option was Tennessee. In 2010, we moved our family, and, cha and it changed our lives forever. Oregon was different, and Grants Pass was unlike anything we had ever seen. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> we spent a number of years building business businesses and getting involved in our business community. See, our relationship was still rocky. We'd continue our way of working things out, you know, fighting, arguing, and whatever you want to call it. I mean, but we still had this understanding that no matter what we would do, we would keep together and do this for our kids. We didn't want our kids growing up in split households like we had experienced as kids. So suffer we would and enjoy very few Good times together was pretty much our life. With all we had walked through, one of the hardest things to endure for me was finding out that my wife was having an emotional affair with another man. She had met someone who had given her a positive feeling. Made her feel good, confident even, and made her feel something that I didn't. I was devastated, and it was rough, but still, we continued forward. I forgave her, and she promised to never do anything like that again, and times were tough, but we powered through just like we always had. See, 
Over the years of our marriage, Jason knew about the physical and emotional abuse that I had, but the darker secret, the shame that had a hold of me, that one I kept from my husband. When I held on to for 10 years of our marriage and 15 years of my life. <clears throat> I definitely had to begin looking at the relationship with my wife in a whole new way. A way in which I couldn't possibly understand fully, but had to figure something out. While intimacy was important to me, it was the last thing on Bonnie's mind. That emotional connection between husband and wife was pretty much broken. The definition of love was something completely different to her. Sorry. I was trying my best to find a better way in life, still not sure of what that was, but I knew that Jason and I needed something to change. Well, God had his plans in place. You see all the work. We had done and grown in our business here. God had planted people in these paths for a reason. I met Allison through a client of mine and began learning about this thing called Royal Family Kids. I began talking with Allison more about RFK and at the same time began sharing my story of abuse and neglect as a child. Eventually, I shared my story at the RFK banquet but also attended RFK camp. This is where I met Jesus for the first time. With all the controlled chaos and the small window glimpses into the lives of these kids at camp, I was able to see myself at the same time. I remember the last day of camp heading to the open field, falling to my knees and hearing what God had to say. I knew that this is what he was calling me to do. I knew this is where my healing would begin. God was working. He placed you, the church, In my life, before we knew it, the Webbers, the Lions, Allison, Leah, and so many more of you were speaking into our life, helping me, helping us seek him more. The conversations we had, watching you, I'm watching you, (laughs) the peace I felt in your presence, all I saw was Jesus, and I wanted more of it. I began attending Parkway every Sunday with my kids while Jason stayed home. Yeah, I did stay home. (laughs) I honestly wasn't going to be forced to go to church again. I had my beliefs, and that was that. I would always tell Bonnie not to force the kids to go, you know, because of what I had experienced. And if they didn't want to go, then don't make them. But ironically, they wanted to. (laughs) So I was a husband watching my wife and kids go to church every Sunday without me. Coming home, happy and loving it, it made me feel left out, at least I could say. I remember one time I decided to just go and tag along so I didn't feel left out anymore. And I assumed that as soon as I walked into, just let it fly. (laughs) Let it go. As soon as I walked in the door, I figured the sleeve of tattoos that I had, I would be judged, shunned, or exiled in a way, and... That wasn't the case at all. People were saying hi to me, and some even gave me hugs. (laughs) And wow, what is this? There was a full band on stage playing some pretty cool music. (laughs) I was intrigued, and mostly I was trying to hold back tears. Tears I didn't even know why they were trying to make an appearance anyway. Why was I crying? Something about this place, something about these people felt different, good different. And a little note here, I told Dennis this this morning, the song that Seth started off this morning was the song I was sitting in that section that I started crying to. So God's working. (laughs) Time went by and we continued to attend Parkway. Bonnie and I were becoming closer again. There were happy times and something had changed within our family dynamic. I remember being given an opportunity to speak with Pastor Weber and thinking, what kind of a pastor takes his time to sit down with someone he really doesn't know and talk about whatever? Weber. (laughs) Pastor Dennis Weber. Uh, The man that told me to let go of the trapeze that I was swinging on and hold on to God and swing away. 
The man who restored my definition of the word faith. <sighs> I totally lost my spot. <laughs> I was changed. We got to share in a special <laughs> moment that our son gave his life to the Lord and was baptized in 2013. <laughs> Bonnie and I decided to get baptized together a year later in 2014, and our lives have never been the same since. As I mentioned, I've been dabbling in music, and maybe I didn't mention that, but I should have. <laughs> well, this continued when we moved to Oregon. <clears throat> I'd begin recording videos of myself playing the guitar and singing or playing the drums, and I really didn't have any interest, to, or excuse me, um, God had bigger plans. I remember at one point, Jeanette and Bonnie had a conversation about my musical ability and if I would uh, have any interest in playing in worship one church Sunday. I really didn't have any interest. Um, I was more of an introvert when it came to music. Right? Where's Casey at? There you are. <laughs> but... Jeanette and I had a little conversation about how it worked, and I was afraid there was music up here that I had to read and learn, and that wasn't the case. So I did agree to come and play one Father's Day Sunday, where Jeanette had mentioned, or what I thought would be, all of the fathers would be up on stage and playing and singing. <laughs> thought wrong. I did. There I was, center stage. Singing and playing, Jesus is my rock, and he rolls my blues away <laughs> in front of the entire church. Needless to say, I was nervous, but God was planning something in me the whole time. He was preparing me for his plan. I have since joined the amazing worship team, and recently I was deemed a worship leader. <laughs> I truly love worshiping the Lord and singing songs in his name, and I love the term, I'm a worship warrior. Amen. When we said yes to Jesus, the real work began. Being a Christian, we thought we had to fit inside this box, and it was hard. I tried to prove I was worthy of him and you by doing what I thought I needed to do to be a good Christian and fit inside that box, but the reality is, I just don't. <laughs> I'm one that likes to scribble outside the lines, and Satan used that. See, you'll never fit in with your family, and you'll never fit into his family. It hurt hearing those words, but I, be, I begged yet again, Lord Jesus, all I want, all I need to know is I am loved by you. My purpose, my life is 100% yours. I just want to know you. I just want to know what being loved like feels like. Real love, the kind of love that a father would die for. See, a couple of years after Bonnie had been coming home from Royal Family K Kids Camp, uh, insisting on adopting a few children, we began <laughs> passing around this notion of foster care. And at this point, I had uh, joined RFK and followed in the footsteps and kept going. But we had a lot of conversations about how we could help out more and what we could do. But I'll tell you, I was scared. We finally agreed on at least getting trained and certified and you know, if and when we decided to actually become foster parents. Well, that decision came rather quickly. We said yes to God. We decided to remove our initial reservations and go with God, but be prepared and aware at the same time. The day we got the call to house a couple of young boys was incredibly terrifying, but the moment we met these kids and officially began, our God hearts were kick-started. Mix in a whole lot of RFK training, and honestly, we could do anything. A 24-hour stay in Casa de Duzers, and we were hooked, feeling the ability to connect with any child or situation that entered our home. Since that first experience, we have remained foster parents to many amazing children, and including a wonderful little boy that has been with us for about two years and whom we're trying to adopt now. See, church, sometimes we get caught up in what we think our purpose is or what God's purpose for our life should be. When the one thing he asked us to do was love. Love each other as I have loved you. But in my brokenness, I had no clue what love was, what it really felt like, and how to give it. How could my heavenly father love me 
when my earthly father thought I was unworthy, I was unfit to be loved. I was unfit to receive and unfit to give. But he knew, and he gave me him. He gave me you. The things that he has shown me, the things he has allowed me to hear, allows me to stop looking through my brokenness and focus only on his love for me. Why are you searching for the worldly definition of what love is when you are already living out the eternal definition of love? You see, culture tells us to be strong, to never show things and only let words see or only let the world see our strengths. But when you are broken, your strengths are worldly and they fall apart under pressure. Fear, shame, loss, and brokenness, these things mark our story. But it's also in the midst of these things where we have found and continue to find things like hope, healing, redemption, grace, and above all, Him. But we only found these things after first discovering the bottom. So that's our story. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing your story. We're going to we're going to multitask a couple of things, so the ushers are going to do their, their bit, and they're going to, what's that? Sorry, people are hungry. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. It was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, lunch will still be there. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, so the ushers are going to serve us and give you an opportunity to, to just to worship and giving, and so thank you for those of you that are going to do that. And um, Jason, Bonnie, I, I've got these these chips that we've been handing out, and Again, I, I just remind you out of 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 11, where Paul looks at a whole bunch of things that um, we become because of our brokenness. And he says, such were some of you, but you've been washed and you've been sanctified and you've been justified. And again, there's some kind of specific terms connected to that, but it, it means changed. It means completely changed. And so uh, we just want to celebrate that with you and to to put put that in your hands as a bit of a reminder and and also to remind us that we're looking forward to in a few weeks when we all get to share our stories we get to share the shorter version the the maybe you know hey 10 years of of good marriage you know <laughs> i want to i want to get my chip for that and to, and to thank god for that uh, and 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 how we got through it and um there's a there's a a, a story in the old testament where um Guy, guy by the name of Joseph had a kind of a tough family, and um, his brothers decided they'd, they'd kill him. That, that's that's how dysfunctional his family was, and um, along the way of of trying to figure out the best way to murder him, uh, they found an opportunity to sell him into slavery and make some money. So they decided, what well, we can get rid of him and make money instead of just kill him. So let's do that. And they sold him off into slavery. And into the story, he ends up second in charge of all of Egypt a few years later, quite a few years later. He meets up with his brothers, and he, he has this incredible statement. He says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. Mm -hmm. Amen. So when I hear your guys' story... It's hard not to believe that Satan hadn't somehow put a little target on your back and said, I, I'm going to take them out. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to destroy them. And what he intended for evil, God's turning into good. I, I love that part of it. And, 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 I'm, and I'm hoping along with you that, that, that anybody that's here this morning that's kind of going, I, it, it feels pretty evil. It feels like somebody's targeted me. It, it feels like I've, I'm headed for destruction. I, 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 I hope that you hear 
that whatever the enemy has intended for evil, however he has targeted you in your life, whatever destruction and pain that he has brought into your life, God is intending that for good. He's going to find a way not only to allow you to survive victoriously, he's going to allow you to take those things yeah. and turn them into something that's good. Yeah. He's going to do that for you. But you have to be willing to be found. Amen. Yeah. If you're still hiding, mm -hmm. it won't happen. But when you come to him and you just finally give up and say, well, we got to do something, yeah. it, it works. So I want to pray for you one more time. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So, Father, I thank you that you do find us. You do find us. I thank you, God, that you care for us even when we didn't know you were there. And I thank you that no matter where we went, no matter what we did to ourselves or someone else did to us, at the end of the day, what was intended for evil, you can turn for good. You're the only one that can cause all things to work together for good. You're the only one that can do that. We can try to survive, but you can turn it to good. And so we thank you for Jason and Bonnie's story. We thank you for how you have redeemed them. We thank you for how you are using them to bring hope to others and how you have turned their home into a refuge. I thank you for their story because it's the story of your grace rebuilding our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you next week for another story.